I don't know why I thought it would be a good idea to do a video on this piece, um, but a lot of you have asked about it. It's actually a really fun piece, but it has a wickedly difficult heart part. And yes, we are talking about Duca's Sorcerer's Apprentice. And I actually thought it would be a really good video because it's a great example of a part that has some wickedly impossible sections that have substantial rewrites, but also really effective use of the harp in the orchestral timbre. So let's dive in. Hi, I'm Danielle Kuntz. I'm a new music harpist, and I am here to help you learn how to write for the harp with creativity and confidence. Um, if you want to learn more, be sure to subscribe to my channel to make sure you don't miss any upcoming videos. Um, so today we're diving into Duca's Sorcerer's Apprentice. Um, we're going to look through all of the major sections in the harp part. We'll talk through some of the orchestration. Um, we'll talk about some of the specific technique challenges. I will let you in on some of the rewrites that harpists pass around. And yeah, let's have some fun. Now the reason why this is actually an interesting piece to discuss is because it's not quite so clear cut on whether it's a good harp score or not so good harp score. And a lot of you ask me about what what scores you should study to learn how to write for the harp, and a lot of pieces fall into this category of there being some great examples and not so great examples all within the same piece. So we're going to start to dive into the murky waters um, with this piece, but we'll probably have some more reviews coming up similar to this. Um, so let's go ahead and start out with the opening, um, which is the very beginning. This is where the clarinet has the melody and then the harp is accompanied with harmonics. Um, this is a really, really neat use of the harp here in this opening section. I have a little note in my score that I had from school when I studied. Um, it says, what does it say? I can't even read that. Oh, it says beginning is heard. In other words, don't screw up these harmonics. Um, but the timbre of the clarinet and the harp harmonics is so good. And as you look at this first line, um, we can talk a little bit about harmonic ranges, but we start out playing harmonics. The next harmonic would be here. But those harmonics are, those last four harmonics would be really difficult to play accurately and also be heard through the orchestra. You can get away with a lot more in solo writing just because of the, um, you don't have to project in the same way. Um, you can get away with a lot more in solo writing. So those last four harmonics are taken up an octave. And the timbre at the top of the harp is actually kind of similar to the harmonics. And I particularly like this section, um, just with the color of the harp, it's so strategic, it works so well. So harmonics paired with other instruments in the quiet sections, that's a go do that. The other thing that we should briefly address, um, I do have a full video on harmonics, um, but the notation for harmonics. Note that in the score these are written at played pitch, not sounding pitch. Um, that is what we recommend that you do. Um, that hasn't always been the standard, so you will see a lot of differences in the harp literature, um, but it is preferred that you write your harmonics at played pitch, not sounding pitch. So write it where it's played, not where it sounds. But because there is so much discrepancy, it's always a good idea just to include a little note in your score to say whether it's sounding or played pitch. That way the harpist doesn't have to track you down to ask. Now the harp plays some you know, interspersed sections throughout, but our next main section is going to start around rehearsal 15. And the harp is going to be doubling the higher instruments with this melody. And this passage here at 15 and 16, this is the first use that we have with enharmonics. Now, if we were to play this as written, you notice how the left hand would be playing the exact same string as the right hand is playing. So there's no opportunity for the harp to pre-place. But since we're not actually playing any Ds in this passage, we can change our D pedal to D sharp to give us an enharmonic with the E flat. So we now have two strings with the same pitch. 
So then we can play E flat D sharp as our octave. It just makes life a little bit easier, especially at this tempo. So if there's enharmonic options, it's always great. Um, you may or may not want to write these in your score, but if you're aware that there's an option, that can give you a little bit more flexibility versus if there's not an option like you'll see later in the piece. So when we get to rehearsal 19, this is our first use of, this is our first section where we have to actually drop notes. And this is gonna happen more and more frequently as we go through the piece. Now this section, we don't actually have to drop a lot of notes. We have um, this melody here. If we were to play what's written, you notice that's a big jump in the right hand. I can't play that accurately. If I practice enough, I could, but again, what are you going to hear in the orchestration? You're mostly gonna be hearing if you hear it at all. You're not gonna hear that low F. You're especially not gonna hear that low F if I miss it, which is what's gonna happen at that tempo. So our simple rewrite is to drop the low F um, there's also um, some schools of thought just drop the left hand in order to play all the right hand. Um, I have a note in my score um, to play both hands. So, but that's the solution I found. Dropping that low F with that jump makes that entire section playable. So being aware of the range of notes within a hand is really important. So we, by this rewrite, we minimize the span of notes from a ninth with this whole section. The right hand can now stay in the same section rather than having to jump down, which increases our span to, I can't do math right now. So being aware if you have past, fast passages, keeping the range narrow is going to help the projection, help the harpist be able to play louder, and if we don't have the risk of missing notes, we can play a lot louder, I promise. And you will actually hear the harp. So being aware of the ranges of notes. Moving through this section, we do have a couple of enharmonics here. You'll see specifically going into rehearsal 20. Um, I do, on the rewrite that I have, I go from D flat to D sharp to E natural. Um, which it just it saves some pedal changes. It saves having to jump between the E flat and the G flat. So it just works pretty well. So over at rehearsal 21, um, this is another example of using an enharmonic. Um, just to give a better hand shape. It might be a section, it might not be worth changing pedals to give a better hand shape, but in this case, we would have to change a pedal to play as written to get that F flat. Whereas I already have an E natural here. And just with the way that the hand is shaped, playing smaller intervals between the first two fingers is a little bit more difficult than playing a larger interval. It's just because naturally I have a larger space between my thumb and second finger. So this gives me a more comfortable hand shape. And on like that. All right, so then moving into rehearsal 22. Um, this is a question I get asked a lot. Is it better to do a single glissando or a double glissando? A lot of it depends where you're starting from and where you're going. In this case, a double glissando is written. However, you're going into a pretty dense passage that requires a lot of jumping. So what, what would work better here? We could do... If we did the double glissando, we're probably not gonna get an accurate climax note. If we didn't have to jump after the climax note, we could probably just lean into that. Like that, but we can't do that. So it works better, you're gonna get a louder glissando in this case, because you have something coming quickly after it by doing a single glissando. Something. And on like that. So this is the case, glissandi, be aware of what's coming before it, coming after, if you have nothing, on either side and you want something really loud, a double glissandi is fine. 
You can also do a single glissandi. That's also fine too. But if you have something quickly coming afterward or before, um, single glissandi, please. All right, so now we're gonna jump over to rehearsal 26. And this is another little rewrite simply because of the tempo. We're, we're clipping along here, this is fast. Um, the way that it's written, you have your thirds in the With the harp, you don't have the same, on the piano, this would probably be fine just because you have a little bit more finger independence with this hand angle. If you try moving your fingers like this versus moving them like this, you'll see exactly what I mean. Um, especially with the piano, your motion's this. On the harp, your motion's this, it's a lot slower. So being able to go quickly between, um, with this cross pattern, it doesn't work so well. So the solution here is just to drop that lower A. Again, we're leaving out a note, but with the orchestration, we're not relying on the harp for the harmony. We're relying on the harp for the color. So fewer notes, the harp can give more color to be able to blend in with the other instruments. Same thing in the next section. Now we're getting firmly into dropping out all the notes territory. Um, at rehearsal eight, we have our big section with just chords on the downbeats. Um, quite a few pedal changes, but the big thing is these jumps that are, are going on. And the note I have in my score says right hand only, alternate hands, but play if possible. So a lot of this depends on the orchestra you're playing with, how fast they're taking it. If you're playing maybe with a student group and they're not playing it quite as fast, um, it might be possible to play both hands. If you're playing with a group that wants to take this lightning fast, um, it's more important to actually play some notes than to play all the notes. So in this case, definitely drop the left hand because with the way that the harp, there's two reasons for this. Number one, with the way that the harp rings in orchestra, the lower octave is not going to project quite as well in orchestra. Um, this lower octave just tends to get lost. Sometimes the very low part of the harp, because you have those wire strings, those can help cut through, especially if you're pairing it with you know string bass, low brass, things like that. Um, but this kind of low register of the harp, this does not cut well in orchestra. So it's the obvious um, choice to be able to drop. Versus your bright upper register, this is what's going to help pair with other instruments to bring some more color. Um, you might not hear it on its own, but it will add to the orchestration. So dropping the left hand is a very obvious solution. But why do we need to drop the left hand? Number one is because this is a muddy register and you have these large octaves. It's gonna take a lot more care to be able to come back on the strings without buzzing, hitting extra notes, playing wrong notes. Um, so it just takes a lot more care. You also have a lot more jumping in the left hand compared to the right hand. So playing the right hand works a lot better and you can actually play this fortissimo if you only play the right hand. And so on and so forth. Now maybe the first line you could play with both hands, but as you get into these pedal changes that you're gonna see, um, in the score at measure 20 at rehearsal 29 your half pedal changes every beat so it's great to pick maybe two challenging things at a time so our challenging thing is the right hand jumps and the pedal changes adding in left hand jumps to that would probably be needlessly difficult given the orchestral context another quick note i have here with the um, and harmonic that you see a couple measures after rehearsal 29 using um, a D natural instead of C flat. Um, it makes sense because we already have a D natural here. No reason to change an extra pedal. Um, so just use the D natural rather than changing the C flat and then having to change the D again later on. Did I say D natural? B natural. I can't talk. B natural. Um, so the obvious solution here is to go ahead and just use the existing B natural rather than changing the C flat and then having to move your foot back to the B to get to the next natural. All right, so then we get into this section at rehearsal 36 with 
a lot of inharmonics. Um, I don't know if these were intended. I assume they were intended to be inharmonics. I hope they were intended to be inharmonics, but we'll see that this was not actually um, calculated very well. Um, we know that repeated notes are particularly difficult on the harp, especially at a fast tempo, because you're having to come back on and replace the string before playing the note. And there's a limit to how fast you can do that. And that, this goes faster than that. So in order to play these, we are using an inharmonic B sharp along with the C natural. And on like that. Would this be more effective as a single octave? Probably, but we can play it, so might as well. And on like that. Um, moving into 38, it goes um, a little bit faster here, but we still have the inharmonic option to be able to make this work. So now we're in the A flat. And just like the opening, using the G sharp not only helps with the repeated notes here, but these octaves. So we're playing the octaves as A flat, G sharp, which also makes it a slightly less wide span, makes it a little bit easier. And on like that, um, next section at 39, we can do the same thing here with our Bs. And on like that, now we're at C. Now here's where it gets to be a little tricky. We have this pattern that's going up, but now we have, we're on D. We don't have any inharmonic equivalent to D natural. So it's kind of all you can do is. If anyone has a great solution to this, let me know. I have not figured out one. Um, one option, maybe you could just like drop, drop a note is honestly what's going to be heard rather than it's probably what I would suggest doing um, maybe not in an audition but I don't know same thing here and this section here before rehearsal 41 um, the top line drops out simply because you don't have enough strings on the harp to be able to play the full octave so there's that if you're doing repeated notes make sure that you actually have an harmonic equivalence or come up with another strategy because this part is just plain annoying. I'm sorry, Dukas, this is, this is annoying. And it gets worse from here. So we have our next big rewrite at rehearsal 49. And what do we have here? loud no one's gonna hear the harp so um, the only manageable solution here is to drop some notes um, the common rewrite is to play left hand on the downbeat and then right hand and on like that um, that's really the only manageable solution um, this works really well for a couple of reasons. Number one, you can get that power with the left hand thumb versus having to rely on the right hand. Second is this upward pattern. You're relying on the fourth finger. It's a little bit more difficult than the right hand being able to use that thumb power. And honestly, in the instrumentation, you're probably gonna hear this more than So this rewrite just allows that extra punch. And on like that. We're almost done, but we have yet another rewrite here. So here at rehearsal 52, um, we have this lovely left hand section. Um, this is again going fast. I don't know how this is supposedly possible. Like, that's a big that's a big stretch under any circumstances not at this tempo so yes we dropped the left hand here there's there's no other solution here um, again loud no one's going to hear the left hand anyway and that's that's the way it's going to be 
Um, so, and then the end is much like the beginning with the enharmonics. So this is kind of a lightning overview of Ducas Sorcerer's Apprentice. The bottom line is this is a great example of the use of color of the harp in the orchestration, um, especially those solo sections, but also the harp can provide some structural support in the louder sections. Um, but keep in mind, sometimes less is more, especially in these loud sections. If you can rely on the louder sections or the louder registers of the harp, like this top range, that's what's going to con um, project through the orchestra. So focus on that fewer notes so that the harp can actually lean into the loud notes. Um, I hope this helps. If you have any questions or there's anything I didn't um, address in this score, please let me know in the comments. Be sure to subscribe. I have more videos coming and I would love for you to um, join my email list. I do send out harp tips emails um, every couple of weeks. Um, so directly in your op inbox if you want to learn more about writing for the harp. Um, I would love to have you there and I will see you next time.